Hello, everyone. Thanks very much for joining us. We're here today with David E. Fitch. David is the author of a new book titled Reckoning with Power, Why the Church Fails When It's on the Wrong Side of Power, just released from Brazos Press. David co-founded Missio Alliance and is the B.R. Linder Chair of Evangelical Theology at Northern Seminary. He also serves on the pastoral staff at Peace of Christ Church in Westmont, Illinois, and has helped plant four churches and currently coaches church planting. You can learn more about the book at bakerpublishinggroup.com. So, David, congratulations on all your work, and thanks very much for joining us. Hey, uh, really good uh, to be with you, Brian. Thanks for having me on this show. It sounds very lively, very creative. <laughs> Well, um, is there anything else that you'd like people to know about you than that uh, rather brief introduction that I gave? Well, you know, uh, I am actually uh, a piece of Christ morphed through various things going through COVID. And uh, now I'm pastoral staff on Renew Church, which is the hmm. church that kind of, in a long, uh, it's a long story, but it's now in the same place, same time. But it's a very diverse, multi-ethnic church in my wonderful town of Westmont, Illinois. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. Um, well, could, could you tell us a little bit more about Northern Seminary and the American Baptist Church? Um, there's lots of different types of Baptists. <laughs> and those of us that are not as familiar with some of those distinctions may draw the wrong conclusion from that term. Oh, well, Northern Seminary used to be Northern Baptist Seminary. And if you know anything about the history of the Baptists in the United States, uh, over the Civil War, uh, post-Civil War, there, there emerged the Southern Baptists and the Northern Baptists. And the American Baptists are the, what are now, what were once called the Northern Baptists. And uh, I don't know, we are the church. Northern, uh, by the way, Northern's affiliated with American Baptists. We have a lot of affinity and work with closely with the American Baptists, but we're, we're, we're broadly... Uh, I would say uh, evangelical is not a term that makes a lot of sense, but we're we're um, mission-minded, incarnational, justice, uh, justice, justice-minded, Jesus-centered uh, Protestants. How about that? There you go. <laughs> uh, yeah, but that that's a little bit of the history. But Northern is about 120 years old, uh, and there's a lot of history there that I could go into, but it would take up the most of your podcast, <laughs> and, and it might, you know. It might put everybody to sleep. So I'll leave it at that. Okay. Well, fortunately, a lot of the denominational stuff is kind of fading, you know, I mean, in terms of its significance, which um, for me has been good. Um, I found more variability within a particular domination from church to church than I have between many denominations um, in the places I've been. <laughs> you know, denominations were formed uh, out of uh, a Christendom culture. Um, we had most people were Christians, let's say, 50 to 100 years ago. And yet there were corrections that needed to be made within the Christianity. And so the Pentecostals uh, and the holiness movements corrected the uh, austere justification by faith, uh, Lutherans and Presbyterians. And, you know, and, and the Wesleyans corrected the, the, the Anglicans that were getting too austere. So there was all these things going on. But now... I think denominations need to become mission organizations because we are no longer in a Christian culture where we get to choose which version and which emphasis makes the most sense. Don't get me wrong. I actually think those correctives did some good work back when, sure, but sure. now we need peop We need denominations to be mission organizations organizing our congregations and churches to engage our culture for what Christ is doing in the world. Fair, fair. Amen. Um, so before we get into your book, I want to ask you about the word evangelical. Um, you raised it, and it's also in one of your job titles. And it's also the title of one of your previous books, The End of Evangelicalism? Question mark. So how do you view that term, given how today's meaning differs in the minds of many from the original meaning? Yeah. You know, I grew up in Canada. I'm not a Canadian <laughs> due to some circumstances of birth, but uh, I grew up in Canada and the word evangelical means something totally different up there than it means down here. And uh, not many people use the word up there. People use the word down here. I don't even know if it means anything related to Christianity down here. It's more of a 
a uh, descriptor of a certain brand of political person in this country. Uh, our friend Ryan Burge from Eastern Illinois University, a sociologist, has done a lot of statistics on this. Yeah. And the average person who labels him or herself evangelical rarely attends an evangelical church or a church period. And so I think the term has become extremely problematic. If I use it, uh, I use it uh, to describe a history of a group of people who uh, not, they emerged out of the modernist controversies of the last century. And, and they are devoted to uh, Jesus, his work on the cross and the resurrection. And they are devoted to understanding scripture as Holy Spirit inspired. I know there's a lot of other weird things around scripture that they sometimes adhere to, but it's authority of scripture and, and engaging the world for Christ. That's kind of how evangelicalism used to be. And granted, it's had a lot of weird, uh, unfortunate caricatures and political manifestations, which for a neo-Anabaptist like me is a disaster. You exchange the church for the state to do the work of God. And it's never going to work out well. <laughs> really. <laughs> so let's talk about your new book. As I mentioned, the, I love the title reckoning with power, why the church fails when it's on the wrong side of power. So how did that book come about? Well, you know, I teach uh, culture studies. I teach contextual theology and the three biggies, the three big things you've got to understand about culture. When you enter a culture, is first, how is the self construed? Secondly, how does language work? A lot of us modernist people think language is representative. Like if I say a word and it refers to an object in the reality of the world, it's going to be equally translated across all cultures. Actually, language shapes culture and reality and experience. And you got to understand that. So you need to learn the language and what's going on in the language before you can even try to figure out how to talk about the gospel, talk about Jesus. And then the other thing is power. So power is a big deal to me in my studies, but also I grew up a pastor's kid and I've watched all the abuses of power over the last 25 years in the church. I've watched how evangelical Class, I don't even know how to use that word, but you know who I'm talking about. Those people who think they're Christians and are going to use the power of the state to impose a Christianity upon a culture and, and more specifically what they think are the most important things for a Christian culture. And that's a bad, abusive, coercive use of power. And so now, folks, we are at this point where we have got to, we're at this cultural moment where, where especially if we're Christians, we got to sort out the question of power, how to navigate it, how to lead within and among the issues of power, how to think about government and what it can and cannot do, and how to think about what Jesus wants to accomplish in the culture for his justice and salvation of the world and how power works in that. And frankly, I think we've got it all wrong, and we have disasters and dumpster fires all over the place. <laughs> And it's a good time to stop and think through this whole question all over again. So, so in the book, um, you distinguish between worldly power and godly power and kind of how that's played out. Could you explain to folks what you mean by those concepts? Yeah, I mean, when, when, when uh, this, this word worldly, okay, uh, having been on about 152 podcasts the last three weeks, <laughs> uh, about the book, I, I'm realizing that there are a lot of younger Christians or post-Christians or post-church people who are not happy with the church world distinction and the way its judgmentalism has been worked out by their formerly evangelical fundamentalist church. That's not what I mean by worldly power. Worldly is just by definition power that works outside of or in autonomy from God. It's worldly. And um, worldly power, as I work through the definition, through the history of sociology and the history of, forgive me for this academic term, but post-structuralism and the understanding of the way power works in cultures, um, it's always power over. 
And Max Weber, the famous sociologist from the previous uh, couple of centuries ago, uh, uh, he said, power is when person A gets to tell person B what to do. Person A manipulates or persuades or somehow through their position is able to get person B to do what person A wants to do. And it goes for institutions as well. Person A gets to do get the institution B to do what he wants him or her to do, uh, or, or even in charge of an institution to impose his will upon persons. But it's always over, and it's always coercive. Even if you and I think we like it, it's still coercive. So, for instance, I'll, I'll give you when I go to the doctor and I'm sick or I got a problem, and the medical system has a power structure. It has uh, power invested in the expert. And <clears throat> sometimes, folks, I hate to tell you this, but sometimes your doctors are being told to give you certain drugs based on how much incentive there is oh, money sure. wise to give certain drugs or advertisements. And there's all sorts of power things going on there, yeah. but I'm taught to go in there, listen to my doctor and do whatever he or she says me to do. And you know what? No one's putting a gun to my head. I'm quite happy, especially if I get relieved of the pain or the suffering or I get healed. And, and, and all I'm saying is I'm just acknowledging power over has works in various ways in our culture and in our churches. No one's holding a gun to fit his head to go to church on Sunday morning. And when that altar call comes, for those of you who remember what an altar, what a good old-fashioned altar call was, okay, there's a power structure there. If we're not careful, it's manipulated. Uh, if we're not careful, it's it's I'm now uh, coming under a pastor who's got all sorts of, you know, he, all that to say, there's power structures there, and I might actually feel like I want that power over me. I'm just acknowledging it's power over. The way God works is power with. The way God works is through relationship, uh, interrelational. I don't mean just personal relations, but relationships among groups of people. The Holy Spirit moves, convicts, reconciles. I believe... I, I'm a Pentecostal, Brian. I believe the Holy Spirit still heals. Okay, that's the kind of, but I don't think he'll usurp. I don't think he'll go over you. I think he will invite you to be with him. And in that withness, healing, reconciliation will come. So in the book, I'm starting out by saying rather boldly that there are two kinds of power not one. And the task of Christians today who actually believe, trust, walk with Jesus, it is to discern the difference between worldly power, power over coercion, which I, I can get into details later, but often leads to abuse if not kept within its limits, and godly power, which always heals and saves and unites and 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 transforms. And that's the picture I'm trying to start out with. I think it's a terribly important distinction. Um, <laughs> I, so there's this verse, you know, that we all know in First Timothy, it says the love of money is the root of all evil. And for quite a while, I debated in my mind, you know, whether it was really money or power, you know, knowing that there's a strong overlap. Now I actually think that the real root of the matter is greed and that power and money can be used as tools of greed. So how do you view that? Well, let's just admit right off the top here that uh, capitalism within the systems, and these are social systems, organized quite well in the United States, capital systems are run by money. Mm -hmm. And who has it? The person who has money or control of money has power, has security. The person who doesn't have money is struggling, is is subservient to the immediate needs of getting enough money to pay the bills, to feed a family, to, to uh, have a roof over their head. So, um, you know, money is the root of all evil. Uh, I don't think there's any clearer equivalence in our culture than that between money and power. It couldn't be any clearer. If anybody thinks, I mean, 
Let me let me be clear. I think democracy is a much better system than an authoritarian fascist government. Okay. But if anybody thinks we have a pure democracy here in the United States, I got news for you. You wish. <laughs> it runs on money. And for some reason, we can't seem to keep the limits on that money. And so we do wonder why we have two people running for president, Donald Trump and Joe Biden. And it's, it, I got to tell you, it is the reason why we have these two people is, I think, probably money <laughs> the control of and the ability to spend money my my one of my favorite theologians and friends stanley Howard says we don't we don't vote for candidates we we vote for commercials and and you know commercials are all about money and so yeah there's nothing more sinister does any pastor who's listening right now if there are any i don't know if there are any but if there are if there's two or three of you out there if you're pastors you know that when you get up to preach on sunday morning and lead the church through scripture. Sometimes you're worried about getting that person who who uh, gives uh, 20% of the of the total giving of the church on any given month. You're worried about getting that person upset and leaving because the budget's going to tank. That's this conflict of interest. Money. Money is the root uh, power. <laughs> I, don't know, I still don't know that it's the root. To me, it, it, it's a really important and it's really powerful, but it's a tool of greed, isn't it? And I think greed is actually the fundamental issue because what yeah, you're doing well, with the money what you're doing with the power is gr driven by greed yeah uh okay i i uh i think i know what you're saying and i think i agree with it uh i'm having a little more difficult time uh breaking uh the 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 distinguishing between the money and the greed i know huh, man money Money. Uh, okay, so I agree there is kind of a holy a way to approach money. I I, I got to admit, I haven't been very good at it. I mean, there's a well, lot I mean, of time. You know, <laughs> money is a transactional thing, right? I mean, it's it's it's, it's a currency. Right? It's it's how we trade goods and services. So at that level, it's neutral, right? It's how you use it, what you do with the money. I mean, you could use money to give to the poor, support homelessness, or, you know, whatever yeah. good uses of money out there. Yeah. I think I agree with you. You I mean, know, maybe we should talk about avarice or greed. Or, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, it's I don't know, but I just struggle the, with the perversion you know, of money. Yeah, okay. with, I'm not I'm not arguing at all about your premise of the importance of power and the misuse of it. Totally agree. Yes, with you. it's just yeah. more I guess more of an intellectual exercise. But well, no, no, it, it, but <laughs> but it is very very helpful to realize how much power is wound up with money and the possession. Yeah. Of money. I have a section in the book where I talk about. Uh, what, are you on the right side of power, the right side of history? And I talk about the way the church, the evangelical church, which is so criticized today, rightfully so, for being on the wrong side of history. But if you look back 100 years, 150 years ago, when it was with the poor, when it was with the hurting, those who did not have worldly power, in other words, those who did not have money, it was not on the side of slavery. It was uh, on the side of abolitionists. It wasn't perfect. There were... There were racist abolitionists, but at least it was on the side of breaking the power and hold of slavery, which was a greed exploitation of race for money. Uh, likewise, with women in ministry and women's suffrage movements, the 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 people without the money, the people of the with, with the poor, were at the forefront of women's suffrage movements. The ones with the money at Princeton Seminary were the patriarchalists. Uh, and so we just got to understand the two are closely intertwined in terms. And then, and then, by the way, Don Dayton, my uh, teacher in historiography in my early years, they're, they're, what happened in the holiness movements? They were among the poor, and they were the they were the people who were um, initiating these abolitionist movements and women's suffrage movements and prohibition movements. By the way, which when alcoholism was destroying people's lives, and and, and yet when they got their lives together, when they got saved. When they became Jesus followers, their lives got put together and they got money. <laughs> and and Don Dayton kind of charts this. He calls it the embourgeoisment of the holiness movement. <laughs> and by the time post-World War II, they were some of the richest groups of people. And they were on the wrong side of the story. They were they were participants in the racism. They were participants in, in women being subjugated uh, in hierarchies. And, and it just goes to show you, money has a lot to do with 
uh, at power and the worldly power and how God works. Well, just like the history of the Roman Empire, right? You know, um, you know, uh, persecuting Christians <laughs> for centuries, and then all of a sudden, the two become aligned. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, Barbara Brown Taylor's got that famous quote about beware, you know, of uh, the alignment of um, money and was it money and power or is it government? I don't remember now, but. Well, you're you're speaking religion about and, religion and government, yeah, yeah, and, and and all that history I put in the last epilogue, folks, in the book uh, Reckoning with Power. It's just fascinating. If you look at what happened in the civil rights movement, it was people sitting around tables in small groups praying, black persons, white persons, disrupting the South, and and God do and and then of course three of those groups went and sat at a Woolworth and that turned into 51 groups and that totally disrupted the Jim Crow South. And this is the way God works, not through uh, worldly power, but through <laughs> his presence at so, work in the lives of people. So uh, one of my frustrations with a lot of very good books on justice issues is that they tend to focus on analysis and don't say much at all along the lines of what do we do about it? And I realize that the analysis is very important, and particularly in complex areas. Um, and I also realize there's no easy answers to what do we do about it, um, which is all the more reason for addressing it, quite frankly. But in your book, um, you do both, which I, I really like. Um, your final chapter talks about several ways that churches can do something about it. So um, can you describe a couple of those for folks? Yeah, I was just looking for a copy of the book when you were at, I knew you were going to ask ask me that question, and <laughs> I, was, I was beginning to panic, uh, but I did find it sitting right next to me here. Um, yeah, like there are some basic practices, folks, that really have been part of God's people, the church, since the beginning, but they kind of get lost when when the church becomes affluent and established and part of the culture. But um, let me just give you a few of my favorite. Okay, this one is always controversial. I talk about mutual submission. I talk about most people think about power as power over, but the church practices mutual submission. Notice I didn't say submit only, mutually submit. So uh, submit yourselves one to another out of reverence for Christ. It's Ephesians chapter 5, verse uh, 20, I think it is. It starts all those those household codes that actually Paul rewrites to talk into mutuality. And, and uh, I was just reading a book uh, last night. There are two kinds of submission. There is the submission that comes out of hierarchy, coercion, military submission. You better obey me or else you're going in the brig. That's not the submission. <laughs> that the Apostle Paul ever uses. Submission is out of relationship. Mutually, I trust you, and I listen to you, and then I ask you to submit to me, and it's mutual, and we learn and grow, and there's a presence of Christ in the center of it. This breaks the hold of abusive power in the church. Like if, like, uh, And this, this always becomes controversial because because the word submit, submit yourselves, or wives submit your husbands, has been used in the first way of submission mm -hmm. as uh, you need to submit to me in a military sense. That's never the way it's used. You know, in Romans chapter 13, when Paul says, submit yourselves to the authorities, he's talking about the government authorities which were persecuting Christians at the time. He's not saying submit yourselves to getting a martyred. He's not doing that. What he is saying is, Speak truth in love and stand in its truth before your magistrate and submit it to him for his examination. And if he refuses, well, you know what's been revealed? The horrors of worldly power and the ungodliness of that government. And that's the way God works. And so all this to say, it's a very extensive conversation in the book and also outside the book, much deeper. Mm -hmm. Mutual submission really does 
uh, transformed the way we have relationships and undercuts worldly power. I always say, by the way, the person in perceived power, the person who is looked upon in worldly terms as the one in power, must go first. You put your uh, proposal out, and then you say, I submit to you. What do you think? What would you do if you were me? How would you improve this proposal? It changes the whole social dynamics. Like, let's say I'm in a town hall ordinance committee and some racist is getting up there and saying, we got to make it more difficult for the wrong kind of people to be in our neighborhood. We have to put an ordinance in uh, that nobody can have more than two cars in their driveway because <laughs> we got the wrong kind of people having five cars in one house. I would like to have a meeting with you, sir. I submit to you that those are some of the hardest working people. Let me talk about my neighbor and all he's done for me and my block and how hard he works. I submit to you, wouldn't it be better to give, have more parking on the streets and facilitate these people so that they can flourish in our community? I submit to you, what would you? And, and all of a sudden we have a conversation and all the ugliness comes out. All the presumption comes out. I'd like to invite a couple of my neighbors to talk to you about this subject. And we can work this out. All of a sudden, God starts to work and the whole town gets saved. <laughs> and racism is defeated at its core. Anyways, uh, I just think that little uh, practice of I submit to you can be a powerful way. No one asks the person who's been abused to go submit to his or her abuser. In, in Matthew 18, it says, take somebody with you or take another person with you and then be ex have that person exposed for who he is as an abuser. So that's a, that's a key uh, practice. Yeah. By the way, I think like women in ministry, I think multi-ethnic church, I think the way we go and do demonstrations in town and be present, not just go make a, 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 a statement, which is important in itself, but go be present. Like when we had a, a, a march here after the George Floyd murder, and we had about 300 people on the main drag of our town, and we prayed that God might use this to bring us people together and and unwind the racism in our town. Uh, some policemen were there, and 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 there's a little little boy there raised his hand and says, "Are the police going to hurt us here?" And the police heard that, and they started, "No, we're not." And all of a sudden, a little boy's voice started to bring the police into a conversation about <laughs> how we can repent from some of the ways we have misused our power worldly power, by the way, to inflict damage on our black brothers and sisters in our town. Anyways, these are all practices that I talk about in that chapter, chapter six. Of the yeah, book. yeah. No, again, I, I really like the practicality of that. And I, I also like what, what you were just talking about being applicable outside of the church. Um, you, a lot of the things that you wrote in the chapter are more specific within a church context but what you were just describing is applicable to anyone right well you know mutual submission in the church's leadership you have to practice it among us before you can practice it in the town hall <laughs> ordinance committee or else we won't know what we're doing well uh, but a lot of people are stuck stuck i mean I don't, I don't know if that's the right word but a lot of people find themselves embedded in churches that don't necessarily um implement the different things that you're recommending. Yes. Yes. I know. I know. I, I know it well. Uh, and by the way, for all those churches, I wrote this book like 10 years ago, faithful presence, mm -hmm. where I talk about the three church, the three circles of the church's life. And if you're not living in all three circles, church is a way of life. You're turning into a maintenance organization for already existing Christians, which always goes weird or bad. <laughs> uh, but that's a topic of another book. So um, I have to ask you, I know you're in the middle of a book launch for a new book, which, you know, is keeping you very busy, but anything on the horizon um, that you're working on next, whether it's a, a new book or, uh, you know, other types of new projects? Well, yes, 
although, you know, I'm really getting, I'm really slow on the trigger here to get things moving, but uh, I have this book I'm working on. I should say I'm supposed to be working on. <laughs> uh, it's called The Many Gospels, How the Gospel Shapes the Church for Mission. And uh, I go through it only the last 120 years in in the United States. Uh, but I I trace the, the seven main gospels that have driven the church of the United States the last 120 years and how each one shaped the church differently. And my argument is that they all got a lead. They all start in different places, all legitimate different places, you know. There's the there's the Billy Graham gospel. As many of us who uh, have a problem with reform forensic atonement, it started. It was a starting point for many people, especially those born out of guilt uh, in certain churches. But then there was the social gospel, which is the call to engage uh, the sins of culture for the gospel. And then there was the fourfold gospel, and then there was. Um, I, there's seven of them. There's, there's the self-fulfillment, the frankly, God loves you gospel, which is a legitimate starting point. Some of us just need to know, especially if we come out of harmful spiritual abuse, that that's not God. God loves you. God affirms who you are in his image and God wants to flourish you. But if just with every one of these gospels, if it stops there, it doesn't end the whole story of Jesus as Lord transforming the world and bringing, making all things right. Weird things happen. I'm just saying, weird things happen in all those gospels. So that's my latest project, which don't expect anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> well, good luck with that, and keep us posted. Yeah. Um, for now, um, this is the book. <clears throat> Why the? Uh, excuse me, reckoning with power. Why the Church Fails When It's on the Wrong Side of Power, out from uh, Brazos Press, part of Baker Publishing Group. David, thank you so much for your work on this and for joining us to talk about it today. It's been my pleasure. Good to get to know you, Brian. Same here.